Welcome to Imagine Otherwise, the podcast about the people and projects bridging art, activism, and academia to build better worlds. Episodes offer in-depth interviews with creators who use culture for social justice and explore the nitty-gritty work of imagining otherwise. I'm your host, Kathy Hanneback. This is episode 48, and my guest today is Yolanda Wisher. Yolanda is the current Poet Laureate of Philadelphia. She's been a force within Philadelphia's literary scene for the past two decades, upholding poetry as a public art. A 2015 Pew Fellow, Yolanda is the author of the book Monk Eats an Afro and the co-editor of Peace is a Haiku Song. Yolanda performs a unique blend of poetry and song with her band The Afro Eaters, and her writings have been featured in a variety of media, including Good Magazine, The Philadelphia Inquirer, Contemporary Black Canvas, Plowshares, and CBC Radio. Yolanda taught high school English for 10 years, which we talk about in the interview, and she founded and directed a neighborhood festival headlined by youth poets in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia. She also worked as the Director of Art Education for the Philadelphia Mural Arts. Yolanda has led workshops and curated events in partnership with the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Rosenbach Museum and Library, the People's Paper Co-op, Artwell, Historic Germantown, and Live Connections. And in April of this year, she organized the first pop-up poetry festival in Philadelphia's 30th Street Station in collaboration with Philadelphia Contemporary. In our interview, we chat about the role of Yolanda's poetry in Philadelphia's historic Germantown neighborhood, why teachers should complete creative assignments alongside their students, and how her great-grandmother's advice about crayons, of all things, inspired her approach to imagining otherwise. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So let's just jump right in. You are the Poet Laureate of Philadelphia, which is incredibly exciting. And you have a really long history of work in the arts here in Philly. I'm curious what draws you to poetry as a form? How did you how did you get into poetry? Yeah, I've been writing since I was a little girl. I was just one of those freak kind of creatures who loved poetry from a young age and uh, tried to write it was trying to write songs mostly. I got into the lyric, the musicality of poetry, I think, the rhyme of it and the rhythm of it um, before I knew what it could do on the social scale. Um, But I was also drawn as a young person and as a teenager to the truth telling that poetry provided in my own life, but also as I moved into workshops, being able to hear people's stories, life experiences through poetry, being able to see people use poetry as a catalyst for change in their lives or their or their communities, um, that keeps drawing me back to poetry again and again. These are, in many ways, issues that you explore in your performance work, but also in your book, um, Monk Eats an Afro. And that book is really fantastic in the kind of range of issues that it addresses. I mean, you're, you're talking about gender, you're talking about racism, you're talking about motherhood and mentorship, and how all of these things intersect with one another. I'm curious how poetry helps us understand how those are connected? Well, it's a lot about form and content for me. You know, poetry is a container for me to explore all of those elements uh, that you described. Those are parts of my life experience. So it's a place for me to hold and to understand and to process those intersections in my own life and the way that I see them operating in the world. Um, but for me, it's that kind of intersectionality is key to me feeling whole as a person. And um, so that's about form, too. That's about the form of me. But it's also about spirit and about how you see things connecting just every day in this really magical way that give you a sense of purpose and a sense of place and that what you're doing is connected to a larger scheme. So one of the things that you've done quite a bit of work in in Philadelphia is poetry festivals. And you founded the Germantown Poetry Festival. You've also done the Outbound Poetry Festival, more of a kind of pop-up type event, which Mm -hmm. is really fun, um, kind of emphasizing serendipity and and poetry and literally on the street in everyday life. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I'm, I'm curious about the connection that you see between poetry and performance. What is it about the kind of live interaction that you find so exciting? It's fun. You know, there's there's so much energy and vitality, I think, in poetry's performance because of the truth telling, because of the humor, 
because of the vulnerability that it requires. There's something electric, I think, that happens when a poet is willing to go there in front of an audience to really explore the full range of the voice and the vibrations that, you know, that it sends out to other people in the ways that it you, it feels inside your body. It's really important for me to that poetry operates in public spaces. It isn't just a private endeavor. I think both of those realms are really important to activate as a poet and to feel for me to feel complete as a poet. I like to be able to share in that public experience, but also retreat sometimes back to the intimacy. I also think it's about turning the intimacy into a public experience. And that's when I think it gets really surprising and sometimes sexy and funky and all of the messy and beautiful things that I think embody humanity. You also perform with a band, right? Yeah, I love that. It's like being on a team. You know, it, it's it's like the, the, the sense of improvisation you get playing with other people. It definitely makes you feel young all the time. Um, <laughs> and it reminds you that art is about that kind of playful uh, collaboration that can't be planned, that totally hinges on your energy and the kind of vibe that you give off when you walk into a room and your willingness to be open to other people's creativity. Do you find it's a different kind of experience when you perform with your bandmates and kind of a hybrid song, poetry, combo type thing? Is that a different experience than when you do, say, you're uh, performing your poetry like by yourself, even if it's in a group of people? Yeah, I try not to make it be because I feel like I'm kind of two Yolandas in some way. <laughs> When I'm performing solo, the, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit more intellectual and it's like, here's what my, I've been doing in my little hermit world of poetry and I'm sharing it. But when I'm with the band, I have to laugh. I have to giggle. You know, we make mistakes and we kind of all look at it. We give each other these looks and there's just this unspoken language that makes you operate on so many different levels when you're in performance. So I don't know, I kind of enjoy having the opportunity to read solo because you can hear yourself, you can listen deeply, you can hear how the words are connecting. But yeah, I, it brings me back to being a basketball player and being on a field hockey team. There's nothing like the excitement and the thrill of a team that's kind of on the fast break. <laughs> and that's, that's what I feel like every time I'm with a band. You've done a lot of workshops in uh, in Philadelphia and elsewhere, and you've kind of foregrounded, as you put it, the the public nature of of poetry or the the importance of that and the kind of community arts aspect of it. So poetry that comes from neighborhoods, that comes from people, that comes from communities, rather than this poetry as this you know dead thing that is in purely written form and doesn't have that kind of live interactive community connection. I'm curious why com the kind of community arts or neighborhood-based approach has been so compelling to you. What does a community arts approach to poetry or to any other form of art, what does that bring to a city? Well, for me, it was a moment, I think, in my 20s when I moved back to the neighborhood I was born in, Germantown, which is a historic neighborhood in Philadelphia um, that's been through a lot of changes that mirror what you know changes cities have gone through in um, the United States. And coming back to this place as a poet and as a, an adult, a young adult, and seeing some of the issues that were present in the community that were not just immediately fixed by people getting around a table and having a meeting about it. I started to really challenge myself and be challenged by the kids in my neighborhood, the educational system in this neighborhood. I was really challenged to think about how I could contribute and uh, contribute authentically contribute with something that I knew and that I could stand up behind. And what I knew was poetry. I was like, I know poetry really well. I know how to, I know this up and down. I love it to death. How can I use this? And so I started thinking about how can I use what I have in my own neighborhood? And for me, that's the beginning of any kind of community arts work I do. Um, it's really important that people here in my neighborhood where I've lived now for 20 years know that I'm a poet, they know that I'm actively involved in my art. They know that they can come to me and ask me to show up and do a workshop with kids. It's important that I'm sitting at the table with city planners and community nonprofits and people who run the special services district or organize um, or facilitate the business districts. It's important for me as an artist to be able to sit at those tables and 
talk passionately and intelligently and informally, you know, about being informed about what's going on in my neighborhood. That makes me feel good about waking up every morning and it makes me feel good about, you know, just walking around my hood. Um, and so that that early engagement with my own sense of, you know, re- wrestling with my own sense of guilt and shame and inadequacy and insecurities um, which I don't think is just relegated to your 20s, but um, if only, for, <laughs> no, if only you, you could get over it then and it was done. Um, for me, it was just like a real wrestling. I feel like I'm still wrestling with that. What's the best way that I can show up for my community? And, you know, that balance between your family and community and when they start to merge in some really powerful ways that help you understand why you're here, why we're supposed, what we're supposed to really be doing with our gifts. So you also have an interesting history in education, right? You're you're a high school English teacher for a long, long time. I was, yes. <laughs> How did you make that transition from the the English teacher classroom to um, poetry as a kind of a full time gig? Did you find that there were things that you brought from your your teacher training into your poetry performances, or maybe vice versa? Oh, boy, it was such a stubborn kind of transition because I never expected to be an English teacher. I kind of took it as a job, you know, before I got to be a famous poet in my 20s. Um, I thought that was going to how it was going to work out. So I never expected to be in it for a decade. And then it grew on me, um, especially approaching education through the lens of my vocation of poetry and thinking about how, you know, as an English teacher, you could engage students in the fun and the passion of language that I feel as a poet that sometimes is totally killed in the English classroom. And so I guess, yeah, it was hard for me to be an English teacher for so long and to kind of suppress my own growth to promote so many others, to promote the gifts of a lot of young people. Um, But that was really, it was enjoying and rewarding, it still is for me, to do that work. But there were a lot of times when I just kind of hid behind that work as an artist and didn't really give myself the time to cultivate. And there were a lot of long hours on the weekends and late nights where I just tried to keep the fire of my poetry going. And at some point I did leave that job and went into the nonprofit work with the mural arts program, which was kind of a step towards the full-time work that I'm doing now. I felt like I needed to learn how to manage a budget and um, figure out how to run the business of me through the work that I did at mural arts. But I think the educational piece for me is a lot about planning. I think teaching is such a great profession to teach you about planning, to teach you about public speaking, to teach you about how to hold the attention of a room, and also the, the, the reflection that it invites. I would go home every night and be like, did I do that right? Did I, did I harm any children? Did I like crush any egos today? What, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? It made me very introspective and critical about the work that I was doing and how it was impacting everybody in that room. And I carry that with me everywhere, that kind of preparedness and the willingness to engage that you have to do as a teacher. A lot of our listeners are making that transition themselves or figuring out kind of ways that they can expand their creative side or maybe make some more room for their creative selves in their professional mm-hmm. lives as, as teachers and as professors. And I'm curious if you have any advice for folks who want to make a bit more room for their, their creative sides. Well, one of the things I always did was write with my students. You know, when I complained about not having enough time to write at home or I was just too tired, you know, I would assign students to do free writes and they might be writing to jazz and it would be this cool exercise and they would write these awesome poems. And I would wonder, why didn't I do that with them? And so, you know, you know, if you're going to assign it, be willing to go there and do it with them. But it's also about you challenging yourself as a writer and keeping your, your tools sharp and also modeling for the students what it looks like to engage in this this delicate balance. It's not it's not easy and it does take real will and discipline like just getting up in the morning and wanting to exercise, you know, but sometimes it's about setting small goals for yourself like saying I'm just going to write 15 minutes every day. And sometimes it it builds up into a wave of something that then, oh yeah, use your summer, that summer off to really go deep into it and explore everything you couldn't during the year. But I think I would say also to all of those folks who are struggling with it, to not beat yourself up about it. You know, to know that there are a lot of people doing that juggling act 
And that, you know, there are, there are not that many people who just have the luxury of being able to do that full time and to use those experiences to inform and enrich the work that you have. So much of your work combines the power of education with creativity and community or social justice activism. And I'm wondering what draws you to that braid? What's so powerful for you in combining um, kind of critical thinking or education, teaching, pedagogy with the more kind of creative or activist side? You know, I think I've always I've always been a person that loved school. School was always a refuge for me. Um, growing up. And, you know, I loved being on a college campus and all of the experiences that invited in the growth. And by the time I got to grad school and I was studying poetry, I started to feel that there have to be more places on the planet where this kind of, these kinds of intersections happen, you know, these intersections of academia and art and activism. Um, And I think college campuses are great places for them. But you know, not everybody gets to the college campus and not everybody wants to be on those those campuses. Um, so it became really important for me to create community spaces where you could have these really intergenerational, diverse groups of people coming from very different backgrounds, engaged in acad- academic work, artistic work, being active in their communities. I, I don't know. I feel like that's what makes me whole as a person. If I'm not doing one of those things, I feel like there's a part of me that's in the shadow. Um, and sometimes that's OK. But I feel like for me to be at full strength, <laughs> I need to kind of have all of those wheels turning. And I feel like that's when we're the most engaged and the most productive. It's the biggest net to draw in the most people rather than just one of the any one of those buckets alone, I don't think does the job. But you know, when you start weaving those things together for people, you see the larger truth and, and the systems that make up our world and the histories that have formed the present. And, you know, you get some inspiration about how we can move forward. You kind of need all of those kinds of characters at the table. So this brings me to my favorite question that I get to ask guests, which really gets at the heart of the kind of work that you do. And I get to ask guests what the world is that they're working towards when they step in front of a classroom, when they step on stage, when they start their choreographic work, when they produce whatever it is that they produce in the universe. So I'll ask you, what kind of world are you working towards when you get on stage at a poetry performance or when you teach a workshop? What kind of world do you want? Uh, It's a big question. I know. (laughs) And whenever I think of big questions, I think about my great grandmother and the lessons that she taught me that I learned as a kid. There's still the same things that drive me. One was I remember asking her what her favorite color was. And she said all of the colors. And she didn't get into all of the heaviness of a big discussion. You know, I'm, I think I have been like six or seven years old. And she taught me about that kind of seeing the beauty in all of those colors. I think that's just something that stays with me. And the other thing she said to me on her deathbed was, you have a gift, use it. And for me, the the better world for me is about people going in search of those gifts, people trying to find out what that gift is. I remember when she said that to me, I was nine years old. I had no idea what she was talking about. You know, I thought maybe I had some gift of being able to see through walls or maybe I was clairvoyant. (laughs) You know, I've thought about it for 41 years. What is my gift? How do I use it? What did she mean? And I've met other people who like my grandma said something similar to me (laughs) like that. I don't know, maybe it's a grandma thing that they, you know, is passed on. I hope that I'm passing that on as a grandma. And I hope that there, you know, children and adults just continually in search of their gifts and also feeling like, how can I use this to make a better world? That sounds like a pretty good system, I think. (laughs) (laughs) I hope so. Well, thank you so much for being with us and sharing a bit about your approach to poetry and how you use it to imagine otherwise. I appreciate the time to talk about it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Imagine Otherwise. Imagine Otherwise is produced by Ideas on Fire, and this episode was created by Christopher Prasad, Michelle Velasquez-Potts, Alexander Sastre, and myself, Kathy Hannabach. You can check out the show notes for this episode on our website at ideasonfire.net, where you can also read about the fabulous guests, as well as find links to the people and projects we discussed on the show.